and welcome to episode 12 of Camology, the Cambridge podcast. And today I am joined by the wonderful Roxanne Dubow from CamCycle. How are you, Roxanne? Hello. Hi, I'm very well. Thank you. Good stuff. Good stuff. So for the two people in Cambridge that don't know about you and uh, the great work you do at CamCycle, do you just want to give us a bit of background on yourself and uh, how you came to be working at CamCycle? Yeah, sure. Uh, so my background was not in um, cycling campaigning at all. Uh, for me, cycling was just something that I, I wouldn't even say I was passionate about. I just wanted to ride my bike everywhere. Um, and as your listeners can probably tell, I'm, I'm not from the UK, I'm from Australia. Um, and um, when my husband was offered a job in Cambridge, he sent me two photos of um, just all the bikes in Cambridge. And it was on that basis that I said, yep, great, that's where we'll move. Um, and it was just really important to us that wherever we went, it was a place where we could ride our bikes. Um, we've got quite a, a lovely romantic story that leads to that, uh, <laughs> which we can go into if you really want. Yeah. Um, but, we, but we got to Cambridge uh, and it lived up to uh, its name, Cycling. Um, and I had a bike, I had come here, I had bought a bike before I even had a chair to sit on in the house. <laughs> <laughs> Priorities, yeah. a lovely gold town bike. Um, and, but what I did find that my, my background in management consulting and strategy and fashion supply chain, uh, it wasn't really the right kind of jobs for me here in Cambridge. And it took me a little while to find my feet. Um, and actually we were talking about coaches earlier on and mm. because I was, wasn't finding my feet, I did reach out to a coach and, and sort of worked with her to find out what my checklist for my ideal job would be. Um, and on that list was, I want to be able to ride my bike to work. That was, that was a really big one for me. I do not want to be stuck in a crazy commute anywhere. Mm. Um, and anyway, I remember finding this job for cam cycle and it was a bit strange and, you know, it was put together by volunteers, but you know, reading between the lines, I'm like, Oh, actually this could be quite interesting. Um, so I took it to the coach and she went, this ticks literally every single box on your list and you can ride your bike, not only to work, but it's in the job description and you should be riding um, to meetings, you know, everywhere you go, you need to go by bike. I'm like, that sounds fantastic. So that was how I found Cam Cycle. Um, and so what is Cam Cycle? Mm. Um, Cam Cycle is, was at that stage known as Cambridge Cycling Campaign. Um, and we're now coming up for our 25th uh, anniversary. Uh, that's in June, unfortunately, because of the lockdown not going to be having the big party and the big bike ride that we had anticipated. Um, but it was five years ago that I joined Cambridge Cycling Campaign, uh, entirely volunteer run. So as the first staff member um, to join CamCycle, we now have three staff. Uh, at that time, we had about a thousand members. We're now getting really close to this big target of 1,500 members. Wow. Um, so we're at 1,480 and we're getting about two to four members a day at the moment. Um, so I think we might get there soon. Mm -hmm. uh, so Cam Cycle. Cam Cycle works for more, better and safer cycling for all ages and abilities in and around Cambridge. We're a registered charity. We've got all of those members and our work is really done by our community. So the staff are here to sort of facilitate and channel that work, but our position on cycling, our policy point of view, um, most of the responses, the work that we do, that's all done by volunteers and by our members. And we're a very, very broad church. So, you know, we don't always agree on everything and we have to really wrestle with these issues. And I think that is what makes Cam Cycle so effective and so strong because yeah. we've put so much thought into the things that we put forward. Um, I've got to say, so I've, got to, guess, I've, yeah. I've got to, I've got to say it shows. I mean, uh, yeah. I, I've, I've obviously for our mutual friend, I've, I've known about Cam Cycles work, but your policy documents and the stuff that you put out there, it's, um, it's very worthwhile. It's, it's very considered. you I mean, you're very considered again, personally in your responses to, uh, you know, to cycling issues in and around Cambridge and, um, yeah. Yeah, it, it it appears that your well, it definitely appears that your 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 opinions carry a lot of weight. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess it's been five years, but you know, at, at the start, you think you know about cycling, and and sometimes that's a good place to start because when you've been in this for a long time, you get deep in the issues. But when I started, I was just I just want to ride my bike. I just want to feel safe. 
how mm. do you do that? And then you realize that Camps I was got so many incredibly intelligent, thoughtful people who have been putting so much thought into this and really looking at what, what is happening all around the world and, and bringing that best practice back to Cambridge. And in a way, you know, we've, we've got highways engineers, we've got people who are the professionals at this work, but sometimes they're very much in a particular silo. And I think that Cam Cycle bringing in these experiences from around the world can help to challenge that. We have haven't come through that formal education there's always going to be things you know I do not know how to build a bridge um, but I've cycled on some incredible bridges in the Netherlands in particular and I know what a good cycling bridge feels like so so we can come and bring those experiences and and sort of challenge the status quo in Cambridge and the UK and we are influential nationally and even internationally with from the work that we do I'm so so proud of, of that quality of work but there's still much more to do we've got so much in the pipeline if only we had time to publish it all yeah um so where do we where do we go from here where do we go from here so um shall we touch on spaces to breathe would that be a good starting point that's a good start it's a good example of um camp cycle campaigning and and i feel that it's actually while well, the lockdown this pandemic it's a recent occurrence this campaign is actually showing years and years of work and thought that Cam Cycle has put into these broader issues. And, and all of a sudden we have this flashpoint, this crisis where we need to react. And, and we've got those answers because of the work we've been putting in. So Spaces to Breathe is our campaign calling for safer spaces for people to walk and cycle and to breathe in the Cambridge region in response to this lockdown. Um, and really this takes in three phases. Phase one was very much about, we're restricted to only one hour of exercise a day. Um, we can't go anywhere. There's actually a lot of demand for um, space in Cambridge. Um, how do we make sure that we can maintain that physical distance while still getting that exercise that we need? Um, and also providing that advice and that encouragement to people who um, maybe weren't mm -hmm. cycling before but want to try it now or they're not sure what the right thing to do. So that was phase one of our campaign. And as we saw across the world and, and in, in the UK, so many people started cycling during mm -hmm. the early phase of that lockdown. And, and it's really important that we're reaching out to those people because they've just started to taste what it could be like. Yeah. Um, let's make sure we're talking to them. Uh, but also people suddenly realized, wow, the air can actually be really clean and clear. <laughs> uh, it could be really quiet. Our local street can actually be really safe to cycle on. You know, there are so many families saying we would never ever do this kind of cycling journey, but all of a sudden it's really safe for us. Mm. Um, so that was that, that phase one of our campaigns really about capturing all those great stories, supporting the community and starting to gather evidence about where there were challenging um, spaces for people. And now we're really starting to, to move into this phase two of the campaign now, which is we're emerging from lockdown, uh, but we've got all of these challenges. Um, how do we actually get Cambridge moving? And what we're seeing at the moment is that uh, buses, uh, for Cambridge in particular, they're expecting 10 to 20% capacity. So all of a sudden, those people who have been relying on public transport, uh, we can't fit all of those people on buses. And, and people are going to be afraid of going on, on buses. Um, so all of a sudden, people will be looking for other, other ways to travel. So they so when you say that are they expecting twenty percent um, uh, capacity or 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 are they are the buses are the buses bus companies saying we'll only accept uh, you know twenty percent capacity how how does that work sorry well I'm still waiting to see you know, the very sort of final uh, policies that we'll have for Cambridge but broadly the the calculations for buses if you're to apply appropriate physical distancing on the buses they're saying ten to twenty percent. Okay. But people will be able to fit on that bus to, to what that bus could take at full capacity. Okay. Um, so the demand for how many people will want to go on those buses, uh, again, we haven't really seen many stories about that for Cambridge, but we're seeing in London that the people are trying to jam onto these buses um, and, and they're, not, they're not able to maintain that physical distancing. So we've got two issues here. We've got um, the fact that the capacity for buses is low, 
and people will be looking for other options. Uh, but also there are people who will have no choice but to catch a bus. They don't have access to a car. They, don't, they can't drive. They can't afford to drive. They're not able to cycle. The journey is too long or they're not physically able to do that. And it's on, our, on us as a community to give those people the space that they need. So if you are fit and able and you have a reasonable journey, get on a bike so that that other person who is not able to do that, they may be blind, um, they may be vulnerable, give them the seat on the bus um, and let them stay safe for that journey. So they're the, they're the two messages that we've got around that public transport. So the alternatives are to get in your car. And we've seen from the Prime Minister, you know, he, he did mention get in your car, oh, or get on a bike if you can. <laughs> we were hoping for a slightly stronger message there. Um, but if, if all of a sudden, all of these people get in cars, what's going to happen in Cambridge? Cambridge is already a nightmare for driving. Um, and, and if we get more and more people driving their cars, Cambridge will grind to a halt. Yeah. So we need, to, we need to come up with options for that. And, and every way you look at it, and this, you know, we've told, we told you so, Campsite has been talking about this for years, the answer is cycling. Um, and if we want to get more people cycling, then we need to make it safe. And to make it safe, we have to do different things on our roads, um, either putting in cycle lanes, putting in modal filters, and we can talk about what all of these terms are. Um, but that's what the phase two of our Spaces to Breathe campaign is about. It's about capturing all of these ideas. So we're talking to the community. We've got a form on our website where we want people to tell us where don't they feel safe. Tell us when you're walking, where are you not getting enough space on the pavement? Um, when you're cycling, where are you too afraid to go? And even if you are driving, particularly if you're doing deliveries, um, you know, you've got no other choice. If you're, you're delivering something big, Big, you've got a lot of stock, uh, but there's nowhere safe for you to stop your, your van um, and, and you, you feel that you have to go on the pavement and that's taking space away from people walking and cycling. Like, tell us that because we can talk about delivery bays and things like that as well. So we really want to hear from the community about where they're seeing those problems. Uh, we've also written an open letter calling on our local decision makers to take urgent action. And uh, we'll, we'll get to that because some action is happening, um, but we've had over 400, I think we're getting closer to 500 supporters now for this um, open letter. And we've really been seeking um, councillors and parish councillors um, from all the parties from all over Cambridgeshire to support the letter, doctors, uh, so, you know, putting forward that public health case for this yeah. uh, and teachers, because if schools start coming back to, you know, we're going to really have a problem with, with how do people get to the schools as mm -hmm. well as individuals and of course, key workers in Cambridge. So we've had over, um, oh, and of course, businesses, lots of business leaders who know that they're not going to be able to get their people back to work until the transport system in Cambridge is functioning. Um, so yeah, nearly 500 supporters for that letter as well. And that's phase two. Phase three, we're not there yet. Phase three is about, okay, we've had some stuff happening in Cambridge. What's good? What do we want to keep? Mm. What do we want to change? What didn't work? And, and what can we learn about this for the future transport system in Cambridge? So we'll get to phase three down the track. The important thing is that we're tracking and monitoring what's happening now. Yeah. So what's happening now, I guess, is the, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the yeah, big yeah. question. Yeah. So, um, and I've, I've got uh, um, a couple of key points, some dates here and things here. So we had finally um, on the 4th of May, so, you know, only a few weeks ago, and this is how quickly things are moving, um, the, the Mayor of the Combined Authority for yes. Cambridgeshire and Peterborough, James Palmer, uh, he asked the Cambridgeshire County Council to start preparing proposals for pop-up cycle schemes. Um, and this was just amazing when we saw this tweet on Twitter, because a few days before that we really didn't think James Palmer was on board and then all of a sudden you know he's really real seen that this is is part of the solution for Cambridge um, a few days after that we then had Boris Johnson announcing a new golden age of cycling um, at question time so uh, that was exciting we've never had such a strong message um, I don't think from from a prime minister about cycling before uh, and then that was backed up a few days after that so the 9th of May you know again this is moving quickly um, the the Secretary for Transport, Grant Shups, announced uh, a two billion fund for cycling, which included a 250 million pound um, emergency fund for local authorities. 
Um, now, that sounds amazing, two billion pounds, but this is money that's already been announced, it feels like a few times, uh, and it was uh, most recently announced in February. So it's not new money, um, but it's come with a messaging that is stronger than anything that we've heard before. The new government guidance says things like measures should be taken as swiftly as possible um, and also the government therefore expects local authorities to make significant changes to their road layouts to give more space to cyclists and pedestrians mm. so this message is coming from the top um, and it's coming with not just the, the funding but a range of other measures and uh, clarification of guidance to to get things happening you know, even down to things that have designed new signs that the highways authorities can use yeah. so it's come from the top it's come down to the cambridgeshire county council so then it's come to can cycle and and we're really pleased that they reached out to us to ask for our suggestions and because of our spaces to breathe campaign we already had over 150 of them yeah. <laughs> So we've been really, uh, we really quickly put that together in, a, I guess, a shopping list for the county council. Um, and that's then led to just yesterday. So we were literally talking weeks, uh, an announcement from the county council of the first schemes that they will be implementing in Cambridgeshire. Cool. So, so do you want to run through, um, run through some of those schemes? I believe Chesterton Road. Yes, absolutely. Um, so Chesterton Road, they're talking about um, putting in some more space, Trumpington Road. Um, and what we're looking at here is um, widening of cycle lanes. Yeah. There we go, I've just pulled up the list. So, so the things that we've got, uh, example for Chesterton Road, they're removing the center line there. And uh, the goal of removing that center line in the middle of the road, it actually, it, um, it results in more caution from drivers. They slow down because you, you need to pay a bit more attention to what you're doing on the road. So yeah, yeah. the removal of the center line does that. It means you can also move um, vehicles a bit, bit further into the center of the road. And that means that they can add in um, cycle lanes or improve the infrastructure that's already there. Nice. Uh, we're seeing the Shelford Road to the Waitrose Junction. So removing the bus lane and widening cycle lanes there. Now, again, Cam Cycles contributed our ideas to um, these lists, but these are not necessarily our preferred schemes and we've not seen the details and we're not saying that we support all of these yet because we need to okay. look at the details. I yeah. say that because removing bus lanes is, is something that we need to treat with caution because yeah. public transport is still part of this solution. People will still need the bus and we still need buses to run, perhaps even more so because their capacity is reduced. Yeah. Um, so we, we need to see what they've actually got planned there. Um, I mentioned Trumpington Road, they're putting on a, a cycle lane there, but again, they're removing the bus lane, but they're also removing parking. That's a really big step, actually. Mm. Um, and then the really, really uh, a big one that's certainly going to get everybody talking is that they are planning to do something on Mill Road. Uh, and on their website, they're saying there'll be a one-way system in place on Mill Road by mid-June. So again, we are talking just weeks, and normally these kinds of things take so long, um, but we're very cautious about what they've actually got planned there. We want to see the, the details. Um, it, because it, we're not sure about a one-way system at this stage. No, but a couple of years ago, did you not make some recommendations for, for Mill Road? So it's kind of in the same sort of ballpark, isn't it? But... Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're so pleased that this is now on the agenda and this is the start. You know, they've said they're going to do something and now this is the point where we'll put forward what we think should work. We'll look at their plans. We'll make recommendations. And, and I think you know, we'll see it refined over the next <laughs> days because we don't have very long um, to make a plan. But um, it was in summer 2018 uh, that we put forward our vision for Mill Road. Uh, and really, it came from a, a much smaller uh, situation, but it was a, a mini crisis that happened on Mill Road. There was a big sinkhole and had to close the road to fix it. And all of a sudden, the road was just really nice and people could walk out in the road, they could cycle. Um, so I believe some of the businesses saw some improvement in trade, some saw you know, a slight decline, you know, but it, it yeah. was a shock to everybody. That, that all of a sudden Mill Road became quite a pleasant place to be. So that started our, uh, I guess, our inspiration for our vision for Mill Road. Um, and so we've published that. And then along came another crisis, slightly bigger this time, um, which was uh, the closure of the Mill Road Bridge for um, two months uh, for Network Rail to do some work yes. uh, 
to the bridge. Uh, and all of a sudden, you know, luckily, CowCycle had a vision, we had some ideas, and that really stimulated a lot of community engagement in what could be done on Mill Road. Um, and we did put a parklet on Mill Road, or well, not CowCycle, CowCycle contributed to the local group uh, doing that. But it's quite interesting because um, it's a very small world, but there is, I don't know if you know about this, but there's a pocket park that was designed by Arup, Arup in Fitzroy, the Fitzrovia part of London. I don't know if you've heard about that sort of research. I've certainly heard a lot about um, these pop-up parklets all over the world. I'm not particularly familiar with that one. But a, a, but it'd be in the same sort of ilk. They had a they they so they um, they cut off traffic to a part of Fitzrovia. Had these pocket parks, and again, you know, it was pedestrians and allowed cyclists to move freely. And again, uh, the research backs up that these pocket parklets you know, uh, taking the cars away, um, you know, from the, that part of Fitzrovia had a positive, had a, a clear positive impact on health. They measured, you know, the particulates in the air. They measured, you know, trading data for, for all the shops. So yeah, there is, there is the sort of, there is the data to back up that this actually, you know, ticks so many boxes for public health and business doesn't suffer. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, in, improving the, the high street so that it is more friendly for people walking and cycling will bring your local customers to the high street. Um, and that it depends what your businesses are like, you, you know, but what we see on Mill Road, there's lots of cafes. The cafes um, that were in front of the parklet did an absolute roaring trade because there was so, there was just always people in that parklet <laughs> buying drinks and coffees, um, you know, supermarkets, there, I can see that sometimes they're afraid that, well, we need all of those cars. The cars are our customers. But from what we're seeing on Mill Road, those cars are actually people driving along Mill Road to get into town. They're not yep. stopping on the road. There's not very much car parking. So um, I, don't, I don't think that all that traffic is actually customers. The customers are coming from the local community who are walking from their house or cycling from their house and stopping in the local shops. Mm. Um, but what we really would like to see is more research on this. Cycle did some very basic surveys um, comparing uh, trader attitudes to um, where their customers came from and then asking people on the street, where did they come from? How did they get here? And, if, and we saw from the traders, um, you know, uh, higher rates of cars uh, is, is, well, sorry, they believe that more of their customers drove to Mill Road. Yeah. Uh, but if we ask the people on the street, they were all saying that they walked or cycled. Um, but again, this was a very, very basic survey, but it just it was sort of to start testing that, that hypothesis. Mm. Um, but we see research from, from all, all around the world that the, the more friendly your high street is for people walking and cycling and, 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 and staying, just having places to be. Because if the road isn't nice, you, you might pop in, quickly get what you need and go. But if it's nice, you linger, you sit around, you talk to people, you, you want to spend time there, you meet people there, you walk into more shops, you do a bit more window shopping. Mm. Um, and and these, are, these are the kinds of things that we'd love to see tested for Mill Road. Um, no one is saying that this is the absolute final perfect solution. Yeah. We're just saying these are things that, that could be tried. But at the moment, none of this can be tried while Mill Road is so busy with car traffic. So we saw from, so the, the, the closure of the bridge was an opportunity to start trying some of these ideas. Um, but again, it was very, very challenging because there wasn't a lot of notice and these kinds of things take a lot of time and planning to put into place. Um, but uh, the park clip with a lot of local community support from local architecture firms, traffic planning, um, councillors, businesses, Camp Cycle contributed as well. Um, it was fantastic. Um, so that was that crisis that crisis got people's imaginations going but now we have an even bigger crisis <laughs> and it feels really bad that it takes cr a crisis to to start trying these things um but now you know we we face a different challenge which is is supporting local businesses making sure that local customers can get there but there's a real challenge if if people have to maintain physical distancing can they all fit in the shop are they queuing on the pavement is there room on the pavement to queue do people need to start trading outdoors more so um, so you know, how do we create space for trading? How do we create space for people walking? Again, if they need to maintain that physical distancing on Mill Road, the pavements are really narrow. Um, yeah. and so you, you, you can't do that. And the road is so busy now. It was fine at the start. You could walk on the road, but you can't anymore. If it's not busy, then you've got really quite awful, awful cases of speeding along there. Yeah. Um, but that means you can't step out into the road. Uh, so what happens is people avoid it because they don't feel safe. Um, 
and so then you're losing the local trade in that way and likewise with people cycling if we want more people to cycle we need to make it feel safer and it, it just isn't that safe at the moment so so mill road is a really interesting one based on that history of campaigning uh and this this next challenge that we have um but there's a lot of really strong views about this in the community and and it's going to be hard we really need to work together we need to try some stuff to see what works. Um, so let's see what the council proposes and, and how we can work with them to do something there. Okay, so the, so the proposals have been put through. Do we know any sort of time scale and when th these initial measures might be implemented? These yeah, so what we're, we're gathering, and, and this is a bit confusing in Cambridge because we have a lot of local authorities. So we've got the combined authority, they have some responsibility, they have some budget, they can do some road space reallocation. Yeah. We've got the Cambridgeshire County Council, they've got some budget, they can do some things. Um, and then there's also funding that's coming from the DFT, which is part of this emergency fund. Does yeah. that go to the combined authority? Does that go to the county council? How do they get it? What's eligible for that funding? We've also got the Greater Cambridgeshire Partnership. <laughs> um, they can do some stuff possibly. They've got some funding. They'd be quite, I imagine, quite interested to, to see the results of some of these um, schemes to help guide their future projects. And then we've got the city council. There's probably some things they can do. They're not responsible for highways, but you know they could be looking at putting in cycle parking or, or helping with um, space and other initiatives in the city centre. Yeah. And then we're, we're talking about a region as well. So we've also got South Cambridgeshire District Council. We've got um, East Cambridgeshire District Council. Um, uh, we've got Peterborough, they're included in the combined authority area as well. And then we've got parish councils also. So we've got so, this is why I'm so busy because there's just so many stakeholders involved in this and it is very confusing because everything's happening, happening rapidly. But let's focus up for the first part on the Cambridgeshire County Council. It appears that these proposals that they've put forward um, to happen in the next few weeks and month that is based on their own budget and what they're, they're able to do or what they're willing to underwrite at this stage but they've also put forward a long list of other areas and, and topics they'd like to explore depending on the funding coming from the department for transport so okay we just really the county just doesn't have the money so they need to see what comes from the dft and then they'll we'll probably get more of an idea the other challenge we will have is getting the stuff to do these schemes because I think that um, you know traffic cones and barriers and things like that are going to be the next toilet paper, and we'll have county councils, highways authorities, TfL, the Transport for London, and so on, um, hoarding them so that they can do the schemes in their areas. There's, uh, a, there's a quote for the podcast, isn't there? The <laughs> traffic cones are no toilet paper. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, but, and also this is this is happening all over the world. So even international supply chains. I'm I'm I mean this is not based on, on any particular. Evidence. I'm starting to hear stories um, that just this stuff, you, the, the, the sheer scale of the demand for temporary barriers and so on must be yeah. huge. So, so I think we're going to have to be really creative. If, if we can't put these barriers up to create a cycle lane, do we need to look at how we filter traffic to, to reduce traffic levels to make it safe enough without needing the separate space? So yeah. there's some real challenges there. So these will all play into how long will this actually take? Um, but it does seem like the county is going to, to start putting some stuff in uh, very, very soon. Who knows? I'm not sure when this podcast goes live, but we might even have something by the time it goes goes live um and then I've, I've i have to admit i've only seen a tweet and i've not had time yet to listen to the radio interview but apparently um james palmer again the mayor of the combined authority was talking about some other schemes as well so i do need to go and look into what he was saying but there were different schemes to the county list so i'm just gonna say it's going to be confusing for a little while and what we really should be seeing is more collaboration between all of these local authorities and 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 a really clear strategy and a big plan that they're showing the community and saying you know we're all working together and broadly these are the corridors that we think are going to need attention these are the places where we see some problems so you community commuters residents why don't you tell us how you think this could work and really mm. be crowdsourcing those ideas from the community because we all know our local streets like the back mm. of our hand but councillors that maybe don't live in our part of cambridge don't know um those little little issues if you just did a little bit here and a little bit there you could actually make something really effective mm. 
but this is where cam cycles i i think is really playing a great part because we've already been thinking about what should the network look like what would a traffic circulation plan look like what does a low low traffic neighborhood look like what are school streets what could they be like you know we've put all this thought into mill road mm. um and we've got that connection with the community as i said in, in just a few weeks um, possibly even days. I can't remember now. It's all moving so fast. But we had 150 suggestions um, for what we could do. So, so we're going to start building that. Well, we have. We've started building that network map. We've identified the corridors, and now we're mapping on all of these suggestions onto that map to see what could work. And we're feeding all of that into councillors and every stakeholder I can talk to about this. I'm talking to them. That's why I live in Zoom. Fantastic. Excellent. Um, so, um, God, it is moving quickly, isn't it? Is this, you got so, I mean, um, so, okay, so you've got the uh, Spaces Debris program. Did you want to touch on the, um, the Chisholm Trail and how that feeds into, is that, there might be a bit of overlap with what you were talking earlier about, um, you know, the sort of uh, policies you were, you were talking about earlier? So. Yeah, so the Chisholm Trail is, um, it's just so exciting because Cam Cycle has been working on this for goodness nearly as long as we've been around. So nearly 25 years. I was always saying 20 years, but it's been I've been saying 20 years for about five years now. So, um, so this is this is a, a really big campaign that we've been working on, um, and it all started about 25 years ago when um, Jim Chisholm, one of our our members, um, he put forward this idea for a a off-road cycle cycleway that would basically connect the north of the city to the south um, mm -hmm. and really for those people listening you could imagine connecting the Cambridge North Station to the Cambridge City Station mm. um, and if you cycle around you'd just be thinking oh my gosh you know how do you do that you actually have to do quite a lot of zigging and <laughs> zagging um or you you've got to go on some roads but actually when you when you look at it from above there really is a, a route that you can form there um so we first published this idea in our magazine and the editor of our magazine at that time called it the chisholm trail because of jim chisholm um and he's just been such an incredible and dedicated campaigner for the chisholm trail for so long that it just became known as the chisholm trail <laughs> to to all the councillors and officers involved in this and and we never i don't think we ever actually thought that's what the final name of the trail would be but it does appear to to have stuck yeah so so we worked on this for a long time. I believe that um, before I started with Cam Cycle, that our campaigners were able to, to get this into the local plan. But as with everything, it needs funding. Um, and it was the Greater Cambridgeshire Partnership, um, once that was formed, um, that they were able to put this on their list of schemes. Um, along with, I, I believe, uh, we'll talk about the bridge. There's some other pockets of funding that's, that's come through to help with that as well. So, so the Chisholm Trail, the first step for the Chisholm Trail is the Abbey Chesterton Bridge. Um, so that is a bridge that arrived just a, a few weeks ago, days ago. Again, the sense of time is just so strange right now. Um, so the bridge was built in Sheffield in three pieces and they, they trucked it down and, and craned it into uh, Ditton Meadows and it's now being put together and will then be craned back over the river, um, hopefully in a few months time. But as again, with the lockdown, but it really does need to be in, in place before the, the autumn winds. Yeah. Um, so that then will make journeys to Cambridge North Station so much easier. Mm. Um, uh, it also means that that underpass that goes under the railway bridge in that location um, is being improved as well. And then once you come over that bridge, there's then a cycle path that will go along the train line. It will then go underneath Newmarket Road. Uh, then you connect onto Coldham's Common. Um, then there's a few streets that you have to go through in, in Romsey. Um, and then they're working with developers to then put sections through. It will then go underneath Mill Road Bridge and over to Cambridge Station. So again, that will be something that will, will reduce um, that pressure on Mill Road if, if people can do these journeys underneath yeah. the bridge. Um, so we can't wait for that, but there's a, lot of, there's a lot of pieces of this puzzle that have had to come together over the years. Um, but the bridge is in, uh, if you're having your, your daily exercise, you can go and take a look um, and see the bridge coming together. I think I might actually. I mean, I've seen the videos. It looks, it looks spectacular. So uh, I think, I, oh yeah, I'll, I'll no doubt Instagram it. So uh, yeah. Ah, do and and it's a nice looking bridge. It it really reminds me of um, 
sort of the rowing boats or a punt it's sort of it's got this boat shape yeah. to it which i think is lovely yeah because that you can see that from the computer generated image yes i'm glad you kind of thought that as well yesterday so yeah yeah and and you these it's it's, I think, been one of the most widely supported schemes that we've we've seen in Cambridge, uh, at least in, in recent years. I think it had something like ninety six percent approval. Um, it was really a high rate uh, from the consultation that was done by the Greater Cambridgeshire Partnership. And it is it's going to make such a difference for a lot of commuters. I, I'm actually worried because. Um, it will reduce my commute so much that I won't get enough exercise. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I have to just do a, do a few laps up and down the trail. <laughs> yeah. Just do, do, do it on one wheel, perhaps. Make it, a bit, make it difficult for yourself. Yeah, I'm not capable of that. <laughs> not on my big, heavy Dutch bike, that's for sure. So, um, Roxanne, so we're, before all this sort of madness kicked in and COVID-19 and the lockdown was, was sort of taking precedence. What were, what were generally, what were sort of CAM Cycle up to? What were their sort of sort of day-to-day tasks, if, if there can be such a thing? Yeah, we had such a fantastic year planned out. Um, and I was so excited because we were really fantastically organized and, and on track for everything. And so to have suddenly wiped everything off the table is, is quite sad um, but we would have had uh, just a few days weeks ago uh, the reach ride it would have been our 14th annual reach ride um, and uh, it's a, a ride that developed from volunteers coordinating you know 30 or 40 people on a bike ride to now nearly a thousand people coming with us um, so it's called the reach ride because we cycle to the fair in reach um, and this is actually quite quite mm -hmm. sad as well because that fair has run for about 800 years so it has yes yeah 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 and and i believe it's only ever been cancelled twice before in all of that time um so you know it just shows how how crazy these times are yeah. um but normally we would cycle from from cambridge um along the river out through the fens to the village of reach mm -hmm. um have a few hours to enjoy the fair and then cycle back together as well um, and I feel that this ride has become, you know, a, an institution in Cambridge. So many mm. people know about it and come on it. So, so that was sad that we uh, had to cancel that. Uh, and then we would have had our anniversary celebration this year. Mm. Uh, and everything was going to be tied into this anniversary theme. And we, we had some grand ideas of what we do around Cambridge to celebrate all the, all the amazing people who do cycle, because if you're cycling, you're, you're doing a great thing for Cambridge. You are keeping the city moving. You're, you're doing great things for the environment. You're looking after your, your health personally. You know, and these are all things that we're now realizing are so important, you know, that individual responsibility. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm. And then we would have had in September, our festival of cycling. Um, so, and, and we may still have some form of festival of cycling. We, we haven't, you know, we need to just see how things go. Um, but that would have been the third year that we've done that and we would have had a range of events. Um, so the um, Cam Cycle Tech, which is looking at the science and technology of cycling, which is so fascinating because we look at the design of bicycles, you know, how do bikes work? What are the materials that go into them? What happens to you physically when you're cycling? There's so many great, great um, themes that we explore through that event. Um, we would have had the Cargo Carnival. Um, ah. Del, I believe is, that's yeah. perhaps where we briefly met last year. That was at Lammas Land, wasn't it? Ah, it was, yeah. There yeah, we yeah. go. Yep. So, um, and I oh, love this event. Um, so we we arrange a parade of cargo bikes because you know it, Cambridge is amazing we have so many cargo bikes and not just for for carting the kids around but for moving moving um deliveries and and, yeah. and a lot of people have cargo bikes to support their hobbies as well which I find interesting yeah. um I now know of two uh beehive cargo bikes to help people move their beehives around so <laughs> Um, so we do this this amazing cargo bike parade through the centre of Cambridge, um, and it's it's amazing because the tourists love it. They're just, oh my god, look at all these cargo bikes! <laughs> and people get dressed up either in their you know their outfits or their their beekeeping outfits, or their <laughs> they just get dressed up in a costume. They decorate their bikes. Um, it's so fantastic. So um, so we would normally do that cargo bike parade, uh, and then we would have our carnival where we have. Um, bike tryouts so that people can can try out different bikes particularly e-bikes and cargo bikes 
so last year that was a that was a sort of a, a penny dropping moment because I uh, I, mean, I was aware of e-bikes and our mutual friends you know talk about e-bikes but I tried one out well I tried them all out and they're ridiculous they you know you you try them and you you can realize how quickly uh, you can go on them and you it's the penny dropping to think yeah this actually could be an option to get from A to B you know from Hartwick hard where I live into the center of town it really becomes that not some nice sort of pipe dream but it's a really feasible really feasible option it really really is and um so cam cycle has a cargo bike um and we've had this adapted by a local um carpenter who uses a cargo bike to transport all of his tools and 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 um materials so he he adapted our cargo bike for could us we, and could we give him a name check because he seems like of course steve from bespoke carpentry it's a perfect name for it bespoke uh and he's he's tried a range of options he's got a cargo bike he's got a trailer he's got um a a long tail and i believe the long tail is electric would have to check with steve but yeah, um yeah, yeah. he he's really looked at all the different ways that he can he move his his things around and he of course also joins us for our cargo bike parade to, to show his business I actually think uh, Cambridge, obviously being really small, I think he did a cargo bike for a friend and somebody I used to work with, a guy called Andy Hall, he, uh, the sensitive gardener, because he, I think. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he's been on, on our cargo bike parade as well, because um, yeah. it's, it's a garden shed on a cargo bike, yes. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so we have this customized cargo bike um, and it's, it's fantastic because you, you put everything you need in it, uh, you arrive at an event and it's on the side, you just undo the latches and it folds down and there's our magazine rack. So if it's a small event, that's it, that's all I have to do. If it's a larger event, we can take the lid off and that becomes an extended table and we take all our extra materials out, put them on the table, put the, another lid back on and we've got this two meter long table mm. plus our magazine rack plus the plus the panniers on the back of the bike it's it's fantastic and i love when people always you know oh you're coming to this event where are you going to park your car i'm like nowhere but can can i bring my cargo bike into the building because that's my table and everything <laughs> um and, and we had had some interesting situations trying to get cargo bikes in elevators and things like that. <laughs> but anyway um but that's got a, a battery in it um, and you, you, I can ride the bike without the battery, but when it's got a full load, mm. um, just having that little extra kick makes such a difference. And, and it's, it's mainly for the starting, it's the getting going, because if you've got that big load, that's quite a big push to get going. And if you just get that little boost, you, you get up, you get steady a lot quicker. Mm. Um, and then of course, if you've got a headwind, which there's always a headwind in Cambridge, <laughs> um, it can certainly help with that as well. And, and e-bikes, they're, they're speed limited to about 15 miles, 15 and a half miles an hour. So you, you can't go that fast, um, yes. but you can just get going. Um, so did I, did I hear correctly or read correctly there, there is some um, Grant, there's some funding for individuals to get e-bikes or did I I thought I saw something on the BBC News website did I imagine that or? yes absolutely so um, there was a EU scheme I believe I'd have to double check where, where the funding came from but I believe it's an EU scheme uh, for businesses to get cargo bike subsidies um, so that's businesses not individuals oh, sorry I'm you, you, it's hilarious because it's just so much has happened that the, I know that I knew all the facts for this, but it was, it was actually quite a while ago um, that, that this was all happening. But I, I believe it was for businesses to get cargo bikes. We could be talking about different, different things here, but there was this scheme for businesses to get cargo bikes um, to show how you can perhaps replace your, your van for deliveries or you can move things between stores, um, just get where you need to go. So, um, but then they also extended that grant to local authorities as well. Um, and so now the Cambridgeshire County Council has just been awarded for a, a funding for 30 electric cargo bikes. Hey, fantastic. So is that, so um, are they, so they've got the funding for 30 bikes is, and then do people, how's that scheme going to work? Are people going to rent them out? Are they for sort of a, uh, a, a use and return basis or do companies apply for that? 
I have to admit, we only um, heard the announcement yesterday afternoon, Sorry. so I haven't that, got the details yet, but they I'm all so sound patient. like excellent ideas. They do. <laughs> yeah. Um, I know that there is, um, uh, the county has got one cargo bike, so that's been used for, you know, to help take materials to consultations, move things around. Um, it, it's great for events to, you know, if you're talking about cycling, show the bike that you've got. Mm. Um, but I'd love to see them using cargo bikes to support the delivery of their services yeah. um, and to, to move staff around, you know, if they're going to meetings, you might not need a cargo bike necessarily, but I'd like to see the council really promoting that. Mm. Um, but, but helping local businesses try cargo bikes because it's a big investment these bikes aren't so cheap they're cheaper than a van usually sometimes you might get a very cheap van um, but if you want to do all the customization and so on um, and also if you're getting a cargo bike you'd need to invest in a place to store it as well yeah. so there's quite a big outlay at the start so if the county can can help businesses try these bikes see if that's something that will work for them um, before they make that outlay that would be great i'd also love to see um, but to shared that, cargo bikes. But yeah. to that point, as a sort of a, like a case study, um, it was a delivery company, Outspoken. They, I mean, they, I mean, they've been, they've been going for a while. They seem to be everywhere. I mean, they seem to be. I don't seem doesn't seem to be affecting their business, delivering everything on bikes. You know, it's... no. So they're they're now called Zedify, um, oh, okay. and and they're now in all over the UK actually. So um, this oh. is it's um a, a range of businesses i believe came together to form zedify and actually rob king who's the the director of zedify would be an excellent guest for your podcast um he's got a range of businesses to that relate to cycling um oh, yeah. but that that is the the purpose of their business is zero emissions delivery so mm. uh and my office is actually above their distribution center mm. so uh and with my background in supply chain i find this absolutely fascinating <laughs> yeah. um so we see the the, the the lorries coming in and unloading the stock and these are lorries that would otherwise be driving through through Cambridge um, and maybe even making individual deliveries and so imagine all the congestion the pollution yeah. the road danger that would come from these lorries making deliveries so instead they go to the outskirts of Cambridge they deliver it to Zedify um, it goes into the distribution center and put into piles for the various locations and what I think is incredibly impressive is the the couriers or the deliverers actually pack the cargo bikes themselves mm. and using their own mental map um, of Cambridge they they plan their own routes and they pack the bikes accordingly so you've got some really there's some very fancy software out there that will try and make an algorithm and, and so on for you to, <laughs> to plan this but so far their own knowledge uh, works best. Yeah. And so then they put all the stock in the cargo bikes and off they go. And it's brilliant because they can get um, to places that, that cars can't. Um, they can get there quicker uh, because there are all the riverside paths, the cut throughs, the bridges and so on. Um, they can get into areas that have restrictions to vehicles um, that, that bikes can get in. So mm. it, it is an effective business model. It is effective for Zedify, it's effective for their clients. Uh, it's excellent for Cambridge. Yeah. We need to see more of it. Um, you know, again, from, from my perspective, I'd love to see micro hubs around Cambridge where um, these deliveries can get delivered locally and then picked up by cargo bike yeah. or even as individuals, we can go to our micro hub. You know, this, and again, this lockdown, this crisis at the moment, it's giving us a bit of space and time to use our imaginations and think about how we might be able to do things differently, yeah. especially because there's so much more reliance on deliveries now. Yeah. Um, and if we're having problems with traffic, how can we reduce that traffic by having some kind of local delivery system? So again, this is just my imagination, but I'd love to, to see something like this. And then tying into that, if the county's got these bikes, could they, for example, have a cargo bike for Mill Road and they pay for the, the county provides the, the parking, the safe storage for it, because a lot of those businesses don't have anywhere to store a bike. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, you know, a group of traders can share a schedule, you know, I need the bike on Tuesday afternoons, you can have the bike on Thursday mornings um, and, and share that bike and just see how it goes. Why not? Yeah. Why not try it? Yeah. Well, well yeah, I mean, it's it's. Um... I'm sure there'd be, I mean, yeah, there'd be a lot, there'd be teething problems, but you know, a bit of we can collaborate in these times of need. Why can't we collaborate and you know be more conscientious after them? So, um, so how can people get involved with Camp Cycle, please? Because you know we need to get the message out there. 
loud and blooming clear, please. So can you, what, 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 what can people do to get involved? Yeah, well, absolutely. Number one is join CAM Cycle as a member. Um, so I mentioned earlier that we're, we're creeping up towards that 1,500 target for our, our members. It's just that, that goal I've had in mind, but, um, but more than ever, we need to show that we have that broad public support and nothing says that more strongly than we have this many members who are willing to put some money behind this cause um, yeah. and say we support Can Cycle. So join as a member um, and that comes with our award-winning uh, magazine, which comes out four times a year as well um, as access to our membership um, tools, our discussion forum, there's discounts in local bike shops, but absolutely join as a member. And if you like, you could even make an extra donation while you do that. Um, <laughs> yeah, 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 go on. Sorry, or at any time of year, uh, because of course it takes it takes resources, uh, really staff to, to facilitate all that amazing volunteer activity and the communications. Uh, more so urgently, people, oh yeah. So could people, sorry to talk earlier, could people volunteer so that they can sort of do the membership? But could people volunteer as well? I mean, I'm... Um... Definitely. Uh, and, you know, a lot of our volunteering opportunities are not available right now because we're not doing events and so on. Um, but volunteering for Cam Cycle can be as simple as getting onto our discussion forum and sharing your ideas and, and telling us where you've spotted problems um, and just helping us to develop that thinking and those policies and those responses to planning applications and consultations. We, this, we are so collaborative and we try to be consen as consensus driven as we possibly can uh, and actually get something done uh, and, and published. Um, so, so get involved in that way. And, and that's really when you can start to see, well, where could I help a bit more? Where can I provide a bit more help? Um, you know, we have our magazines get delivered by volunteers. Um, we have articles written for our magazine by volunteers help with the website would be fantastic if you're really knowledgeable helping to write our policy documents create drawings there's graphic design that we could have help we could do with some help with as well um, so get involved but the first thing is is join as a member and then send me an email we'll have a chat and we'll find out what the right thing is for each individual um, and then more more sort of urgently is our spaces to breathe campaign um, so get onto our website, sign our open letter uh, calling for urgent action. Even though we're seeing some action, we still need to show that we've got that public support because we've still got a long way to go. There's still a lot more to do. Um, and you know, we need to make sure we don't just get five little schemes that don't connect up to anything. We need yeah, to make yeah, yeah. sure we get that big network strategy. So we need people to sign that letter, share that letter, ask, your, ask the owner of your company, your boss to sign that letter, ask your GP to sign it, your local counselor, we need to get support in that letter. Then there is our form for um, suggestions. So tell us those places that you don't feel safe. Please go and, and, and fill in that form. Tell us your ideas. Um, and then also Cam Cycle, we've, we've usually been a more of a city-based campaign, but the nature of this um, response for Spaces to Breathe needs to be regional. We're seeing now we've got the Combined Authority, we've got the Greater Cambridgeshire Partnership, these are more regional um, bodies. So we're really looking for people all over Cambridgeshire to get in touch if they can represent their local area um, in this campaigning activity. So we're, we're creating a group to, to collaborate with people from Ely and Water Beach and Horning Sea, Peterborough um, and, and south of Cambridge as well. Because you correct me if I'm wrong, you're already collaborating with Sus Sus Trans, or do I? Absolutely, we we collaborate with Sus Trans, um, with Cycling UK. Uh, we work with um, other cycling groups um, that have probably have some affiliation with British Cycling and, and Cycling UK. Uh, we work with other local campaigning groups. There's the A10 Cycling Campaign, Water Beach Cycling Campaign, Hunt Cycle Walking and Cycling Forum. Um, just we're really trying to build this network across the the whole region. Um, also, we contribute nationally, so we're a member of the All Party Parliamentary Cycling and Walking Group. Um, so we contribute to them and, and attend their events. We talk to LCC, we talk to Cycling UK at a national level as well. Um, so we're really trying to do what we can to help the movement nationally as well as locally. But if yeah. you are in the region and you can help, do get in touch, send us an email. But just be a member and learn more about what we do and and 
just start noticing, oh, that could be better. I should tell someone about that. I should share that idea. I'll tell my local counselor and mm. bit by bit, um, things will improve. Cool. I'm just, I, again, as I, I'm zoning out because as, as, you're, as you're talking, I'm just thinking of my cycle from Hardwick into Cambridge and I'm thinking, yeah, this little point there and yeah. Yeah. You can yeah. always tell where a cycling campaigner lives because they tend to get, yeah, uh, we joke that all cycle, all cycleways lead to Jim Chisholm's house, for example. <laughs> <laughs> so the Chisholm Trail is a, a clearly a missing connection there, but um, you can really tell where people get engaged in, in, in what they want in their local community. Um, and there are so many ways that you can help make those local changes and, and Camp Cycle is here to help. Um, so I just say get on that discussion forum. I know discussion forums sound terrifying, but it's not that bad, but you can get on there and say, hey, this is in my area and, and I, I, I know it's not good enough, but I don't quite know what to do. And you will have so many people who, like, oh, here are 20 ideas of how you could fix that. And you'll always be saying, okay, I don't need that much help. Just, <laughs> um, there's a lot of knowledge there. And then, so so can people sort of on this discussion forum sort of take pictures on their phone and upload those pictures? Is it you know interactive and sort of? Absolutely. Um, and so I think again, one of the things that makes Cam Cycle so fantastic is particularly because we're in Cambridge, you've got lots of software engineers, for example. <laughs> so we have a lot of custom built um, applications that support our work. So so we use something called Cyclescape um, and that is now used internationally. So that was developed in Cambridge for CamCycle. It is now used nationally. Um, and that's our discussion forum. And yeah, it connects to the planning systems at the council so that we get a feed in of planning applications. So again, this is why we're so efficient at responding yeah. to planning applications because we have this, um, this technology behind us. So yeah. planning application goes in, we look at it, that looks relevant. It goes into our discussion forum. We talk about it. We work together to create a response. We submit it. And just about every single planning application that goes through Cambridge City Council is looked at by CamCycle. And if necessary, we respond. Um, so, you know, and, you know, we've helped local people, for example, um, there was a, a local resident who built a cycle parking um, unit storage unit in on their property and then the council said they had to take it back out again and we were able to support them they had to make some amendments but yeah, yeah. if they hadn't come to us it probably would have just had to be ripped out but we were able to advise them on well here's the right policies you can refer to here are the stakeholders the councillors you need to talk to and they were able to to keep that so we really can help on that micro level as well as shaping entire new developments like water beach which is going to be huge we have fundamentally shaped the, hmm. the road network and the land use of that development so that it can be as sustainable as possible for active travel through active travel modes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, this takes decades of work um, before anyone will, will ride a bike on a single one of those roads that we've, we've helped to, to shape where they go. Um, so I've, I've wandered off everywhere here, but I was, <laughs> uh, so we we're talking about the technology, weren't we? <laughs> photos. I was getting to the point about you can load up a photo. So the other thing that CamCycle has is, uh, is Cycle Streets. Again, a Cambridge invention now used all over the world. Um, and that is another um, application. It, not only can you plan your cycling journey, um, and it's fantastic for that because you can plan your cycling journey by the safest and quietest route which is really hard to do with any of the other options. But you can also go on there and, and, and put in any problems that you see and put up a photo as well. And that then feeds into Cyclescape. So, yeah. so lots of, um, we've got decades of, of history of what has happened on Cambridge roads in, cycles, in cycle streets. Um, so we can go, oh, well, that looks like this now, but 10 years ago, it looked like that. Yeah. Um, so that's fat, really helpful for campaigning. Um, there's so, lots of other things we've developed, but yes. So I put uh, this is this is what a podcast host does. He does this and say so I put a link in the uh, in the, the the biography of this of this. Uh, yeah, just below pod the podcast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so every, everybody can see all these web links because that sounds. Um, do you want to name check the people that created all these wonderful pieces of software? Or are they too too? Uh, Oh, well, there are, there are um, Martin Lucas Smith, who's our trustee, uh, and, and Simon Nuttall, he's one of our, our members, and yeah. lots of other people. David Earl, who was one of our founding members of CamCycle, um, he was uh, the, one of the first committee members. He also established our membership management system 
which is now being used by other campaigns as well called Cameo. So if anyone needs a membership management system, we've got <laughs> one of those as well. Uh, and but again, this is what makes CamCycle so unique. And I think people don't realize this, that level of, of operational capability that has been produced by volunteers so that we can be this effective. So we've got their cycling knowledge, but we've also got that, that, that software knowledge, that operational knowledge that makes this organization function so well. But I actually want to go back to something you said about fundamentally changing the layout of the roads and the new water beach development. That is one hell of an achievement. Yeah, um, absolutely. We don't, and a lot of it is, it can be frustrating because we know we've made a huge amount of influence, but it still isn't getting to that level that we know we need. And we look to the Netherlands in particular for inspiration and developments there because they, what, what I think a lot of people don't understand is if you want a good cycling environment, you need to plan it before a single road is put into place. Yeah. And if you plan it really effectively, you don't need a lot in the way of cycle lanes because you, you plan the network so that you've got quiet streets and you've got these filters so that people can cycle from A to B without having to go on a major road and the only car traffic they're encountering is local traffic and you people don't speed on their own street because they don't want to run over their own children or their own next door neighbor but they tend to be okay speeding on someone else's street so 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 keep it local and then you need to plan well what are the access roads that come in and out of these sections um, and then what is the big ring road that goes around it so if you plan this road network appropriately and you think carefully about where you put your shopping center where do you put your school where do you put the places that people are going in relation to where people live so that the, the easiest and best way to get there is by cycling mm. you, you immediately you've just dropped those traffic volumes you don't need such extensive engineering of cycle lanes and so on mm. you just need those on the access roads and the ring roads. so so we've really been pushed this this approach for for water beach and it hasn't been me personally it's, it's been other um people involved with cam cycle but it has really pushed that along other developments that have sort of stepping in that direction you know for example eddington um in west cambridge was you know seeing some of those concepts that the the, the final implementation still isn't at a dutch level but you, you start to get a taste there yeah i mean i, I would i would uh I name check that as well because I did that route the other day where I went from Hardwick and purposely went through um, uh, went through Eddington up into Girton and uh, yeah I could I could begin to see the you know how, how it, cycle friendly it was I noticed how wide uh, you know the cycle paths were how they were partitioned obviously away from the main road so yeah I mean um, but you're but you're saying that the the Dutch fundamentally have have a way ahead with their master planning and their yeah. miles ahead M miles ahead absolutely um and uh, you know they they are dealing with um a very different environment you know different different culture different values um different terrain uh you know for example the you know a lot of the netherlands is is reclaimed land you know they've literally mm. physically created that country um so so when you've made it you feel like you can change it a lot easier whereas here um in in england even though you know the fens were created by dutch engineers um okay. you know parts of this looks very very dutch so we you know in, in theory we've reclaimed some land here as well but we we don't have quite that culture of yeah it's not working just rip it out and redo it you know we're, we're a lot more conservative in terms of conserving what is around us so yeah. we need to work within those values um we need to you know work out what is special what do we keep what can we change um but also in it's easy to say that you know all the netherlands you know their their situation is different that wouldn't work here but if you look at photos from the netherlands in the in the 70s mm. um it looked like it looked like it did here they had these you know medieval town centers that were just filled up with cars and car parks um and over the years they've just completely changed that to the point where you, it's just impossible to imagine what it was like and what it was like is what we have here mm. um and I mean, again yeah, I just I'm have to point. Yeah, sorry. go. Sorry. <laughs> well, because I mean, I mean, I'll go. I'll go. Um, I mean, so I'm interested. So, so was that? So, from from a Dutch point of view, was that sort of one government that brought that in? That seems like a massive, excuse the phrase, it's like a sea change, doesn't it? You know, to 
they did they had a sea change and and again this uh, there are so many elements to this and i i disclaimer i went and studied this in the netherlands last year <laughs> i did a I, I did a summer school there so <laughs> i could go on all day i've done another podcast uh, sorry another um video about that so if you go to cam cycles facebook page you can hear my talk about that um but there are many, many factors that, that come into why the Netherlands is the way it is, but um, two that are particularly relevant to us right now, I think. Um, one is there was a crisis in the yeah. 70s um, with uh, un the unavailability of fuel, or you know, scarcity of fuel. That meant people couldn't drive, uh, so they had to turn to the bike. So all of a sudden the government had to, to act uh, so people could move around. So you've got that crisis. The other thing you have is really effective campaigning. Um, and there's a, a the famous campaigning movement is stop the kinder mod or stop the child murder. Um, and this really came because there were just so many children being killed on the roads in the Netherlands mm. um, that parents really sort of got together and, and pushed forward this campaign. Um, and they campaigned very hard. So when you've got this big campaigning push, you've got this crisis and this reason to act, you have a, a cycling culture that's already there that you can build on um, and you have a, a, a landscape that you can mold, all of a sudden that all comes together. And guess what? That's what we have in Cambridge. We have some great campaigning going on. We have a crisis um, that we need to respond to. We have an amazing cycling culture and we have a place, you know, the weather is mild, the terrain is flat. Um, we've got places we can work with. Now's the time to do it. Mm. Well, on that note, that sounds like a perfect way to end it, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, otherwise we'll be stuck for two hours while I talk about what I learned in the Netherlands. Or I could talk about my favorite bridges as well, if you like. Oh, well, that's <laughs> That's, pod, that's podcast number one, two, and two, three, and four. Yeah. Never ask a cycling campaigner about bridges. It's, no. yeah. That's rock and roll, isn't it? That's rock and roll. <laughs> cool. It's a bit embarrassing. It's all good. See you soon, Roxanne. Excellent. Bye -bye. Thanks for having me. Bye. See ya. Bye bye.